And specifically today, um, our presenter is uh, Dr. Martin Held uh, from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, he uh, is uh, a president of uh, Cleveland uh, uh, Micromineral uh, Society. But to be more uh, precise, uh, the society is called uh, Micromineral Society of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, uh, which uh, is an interesting parallel to uh, MSDC. Uh, as, as we all know, we are very proud of our uh, connection uh, to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And here we have uh, another uh, mineralogical society uh, also connected to, to another uh, natural history museum. And the uh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History is uh, also quite well known. Um, it's uh, over 100 years old. Uh, I believe last year they celebrated the 100th uh, anniversary. Um, and uh, so Dr. Martin Held is uh, a, a president of, the, of that society working in conjunction with the Cleveland Museum. Um, he happens to be uh, in the explosive business, which is interesting. If, if you ever were thinking of uh, exploding things and uh, uh, breaking things apart, he, he is doing that for a living. Uh, as he put it, um, the company he works for is in the business of taking uh, big rocks and making small rocks out of them. Um, and and uh, that company, Austin Powder Company, is uh, the oldest private uh, company in the world in this business going back to 1833, I believe. Uh, Dr. Held and, and his spouse are both uh, mineral collectors. Uh, although they keep strictly separate uh, collections with slightly different interests, but uh, they enjoy going to a Tucson uh, show uh, on an annual basis when it's open, of course, uh, and uh, collecting in Europe, uh, including England, Germany, and uh, Switzerland. Today's presentation happens to be uh, on one of uh, uh, mineralogical areas in England, uh, Cornwall one of the very well known, well, maybe one of the oldest uh, mining areas in the world. Um, th there are stories about uh, mining uh, tin and uh, tin containing minerals there uh, going back to the Bronze Ages. And uh, miners of Cornwall were known throughout the world uh, for their uh, engineering uh, abilities. There are mines going uh, down to 100 meters uh, and uh, uh, I, I recall presentations in this club about mines uh, in this country, uh, which took, were put together uh, thanks to uh, uh, expats coming from Cornwall with that knowledge and the building mining industry in the United States. So today's presentation about minerals on Cornwall and uh, Dr. Martin Held is our presenter. Uh, Martin, uh, welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Yuri, for the uh, introduction. And um, thank you um, to all of you um, to inviting me um, to this uh, meeting and uh, to share a presentation on Cornwall. Um, just about before I start the presentation, um, a few words. So it's um, those who joined early to this meeting, it's just, just about 30 years that um, my uh, wife today, girlfriend at the time, we made a trip to Washington, D.C. in uh, April 1991. Uh, I was visiting a conference there, and then we enjoyed the time uh, visiting the Smithsonian. Um, we spent two half days there, which by far was not enough uh, to go through everything, particularly not uh, the mineral collection. It was just amazing. It's, we still remember that time very well. Um, so with all this... Um, this COVID thing and, and the virus and not being able to travel. So um, inspiration for um, this talk um, was um, two years ago, um, I was visiting England and um, I was collecting some nice fluorides in Derbyshire. And uh, so then staying at home last year, so we got this, um, you see this year, the um, extra lapis, uh, it's a German mineral journal series uh, it was about Cornwall, so I was, as you have time, spending at home more than you would be traveling normally. 
was reading all this book and very interesting, inspiring, and looking at the minerals and to say, okay, uh, why not for our club do a presentation of that? So that's how that came up. Um, so I will now start to share my screen. And uh, so we checked the technical part before it worked then. I hope it works now. And uh, so please enjoy. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. We can do that at the end, but I'm comfortable if you have something in between. Um, just raise your hand and, and ask. All right, so Cornwall, United Kingdom, geology and minerals. Um, this is a reference material that uh, I've been using. So that's the extra lapis uh, edition that I just showed you. Um, then um, some internet sources, including uh, Mindad <coughs> and uh, some others here. So what about the region? So here you see the, uh, the map. Um, let me use this pointer here. Let's see the other. So here you see the um, British Islands, um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and um, England, Scotland, uh, Wales, and this tiny part here. This is uh, Cornwall. Um, so that's um, due to the um, Gulf Stream. Uh, it's a quite mild climate there uh, in Western Europe. So historically, when you look back, um, I found it interesting uh, reading another book that in the Victorian age, 19th century, there were greenhouses that were growing pineapples um, that were brought by ships at that time, um, the seedlings. And uh, so then you could rent the pineapple uh, for a party, not to eat them, but just to display them and show your wealth. Um, I find that quite stunning. So today you can buy pineapples at every grocery store. Um, right, so um, geology, so um, this part here displaying uh, Cornwall, you see mainly here um, the upper lower, upper Devonian, um, Devonian. Uh, here we go toward the north into uh, Carboniferous. Uh, so when you look on the UK map, so this then goes towards the um, coal mines in Wales and then further to Middle England. And here you see um, granites, um, some schist here, or serpentinite. So and here in these um, disruptions in these areas, so this is where you have the, the um, <clears throat> metals um, for mining to occur, which you will see on the following slide. So here um, you see the um, the main areas for lead, copper, and tin. So you see a tin concentration here in this area, uh, also quite an amount of copper and, and lead around here. And then there's other smaller tin regions uh, here and also towards uh, Devon. <clears throat> and then in this granite areas here, uh, you have more land. Uh, so the famous Dartmoor, it's famous for its uh, old prison there. So main areas of mining, um, this part Cornwall goes well into, into Devon for copper, uh, copper and some tin. So here you see the, the mining regions and then the, the metals here uh, being displayed. So mining in Cornwall and Devon, um, it began in the Bronze Age, so well before um, Jesus' birth, uh, so more than 2,000 years before that, and ended at least temporarily with the closure of the South Crofty tin mine um, in 1998. Um, tin and later copper were the most commonly extracted metals. Um, some tin mining continued long after mining of other metals had become unprofitable. Um, so tin then was, was um, still mined um, as being um, an important uh, metal being used um, for industrial purposes.
here's some uh, some pictures. Um, these were taken from midnight, so that's um, from the old mines. Uh, you see some um, stacks here uh, for the steam engines and uh, some towers where the, the shafts had been taken down. And so the, the mines, uh, we'll see that later on, um, go well um, under the underneath the sea level to the seaboard. Uh, some pictures to give an impression on the mining conditions here, um, taking down shafts. So you see here the, uh, uh, the, the workers and then the scaffolding um, with the, uh, the staircases and here deep, deep inside the mine, um, se securing um, the, the rock and then digging through. I can imagine that's quite un un uncomfortable conditions. Um, that it had been it reminds me of the uh, the coal mines in Germany that I had been able to visit years ago before they closed. Um, it's quite quite similar down there. So here, oops, sorry about that. Um, so let's see if this link here works. Um, I wonder if you need to turn off the laser. There we go. Yeah. You see that? So um, this website is a call, called um, Abandoned uh, Mine Models. Um, so um, that's from uh, various mines around the world. Uh, so the person um, Oh, that prepared that, that web page and did a lot of work is on it is uh, Dr. Keith uh, Ross. He's a, a mining engineer. Um, so what he and his team did, they took um, the information, all maps, um, so all hard copies of old mines, and then they were building 3D models, uh, which is quite impressive here. So when you look at, at Cornwall, and as uh, so you scroll through, through here, uh, I, Pick this one out. This is this is really interesting. So here you see the the um, UK, the mainland here, and this is a sea, the, the bluish color here. This is a sea, and this here is the, then the model of the mine shaft. And here you can see in these areas where the shafts go we well below um, the water level, and and we're talking about a couple of miles here, um, and then you see. The, the sea. So can you imagine you start your shift uh, just to get there and imagine where you're working with all the water on top of your head. Um, I found that um, quite interesting. So let's talk about looking to minerals. Um, so in Cornwall, there's uh, Four, uh, 504 known minerals. Um, that includes 40 type localities. Um, just have listed a, a few here. Um, for sure, you all know about the uh, Bottlerkite from the Bottlerk mine and the Cornwallite and some others here. Um, I was impressed to see, um, I was surprised to see the, um, the Ludnabite, Vivianite um, coming from Cornwall, the type locality. I would have expected those phosph phosphates to um, come from somewhere else with the type locality. And uh, then here, the fluorapatite, that's a co type locality that's also um, in Saxony, um, where it is um, listed or named as type locality for that. Um, here we have um, two more videos that um, gives you a bit of an impression on um, the mining um, in Cornwall, uh, on the abandoned mines, and um, a bit of uh, a history on how a mining Cornwall developed and the importance particularly for tin.
jagged edge of Cornwall jabs defiantly into the Atlantic. Only the most durable rock can resist that ocean's pounding. This tough coastline doesn't give up its treasures easily. But from the earliest times, men have been drawn here to pit themselves against the granite. Hidden inside the rock is a magical ingredient that brought the world to the Cornish coast. They came in search of a rare metal with remarkable properties, tin. The relics of tin mining can be seen along the north coast of Cornwall. The engine houses and their chimneys may be derelict, but these ruins are reminders of an industry that connects us directly to the ancient world, thanks to a humble household object. How about this, a tin? Nowadays though, you'd probably call it a can made of aluminium or steel. But the originals started out in the 1800s and were made of iron. Iron coated with a thin layer of tin. Tin doesn't rust. It's one of its many magical properties. And food kept in rust-free tin cans remained edible for ages. But ages and ages ago, tin was at the cutting edge of a much bigger revolution. Mix tin with copper and you get bronze. The birth of the Bronze Age, some three and a half thousand years ago, owed a lot to the tin of the Cornish coast. Archaeologist Adam Sharp has studied ancient bronze tools. An axe head is the sort of staple working tool of the Bronze Age. Virtually every piece of bronze that you find in, in Western Europe has got Cornish tin in it. Once people the world over realise that tin is to be had here, Cornwall becomes pivotal. Absolutely. In terms of distribution on the Earth's surface, tin is, is very rare indeed. Even in, in terms of sort of Western Europe, um, there's a bit in Iberia, in Spain, um, there's a little bit on Sardinia, but almost all of it is in Cornwall and West End. And it means that the people who controlled that resource traded all over Western Europe. Thousands of years ago, long and perilous journeys were being made to this coast. As the Bronze Age boomed in Europe, they needed Cornish tin. The tin trade wasn't just with near neighbours across the Severn Sea, but with the wider world. Tin was travelling as far away as ancient Greece and the Middle East. Bronze Age traders took great risks navigating this treacherous coastline, but the rewards were worth it. Copper tool, it blunts very, very easily. It's too bendy. Adding just the right amount of tin, 10, 11% of tin, makes it hard, makes it tough, it's sharp, movable, it can be polished. What in the mean is bronze being used to make? Utilitarian tools, axes and knives and chisels and things like that. Enormous range of jewellery and weapons, of course. And it's the making of swords, which is absolutely typifies the, the later drop out of the Bronze Age. So in a way that puts Cornwall at the centre of an international arms trade, for instance. <laughs> Throughout the Bronze Age, ancient armies relied on the Cornish coast for the raw materials of battle. Hiya, Neil. Hello. To see why, I'm meeting Neil Burridge, who still practices the age-old art of forging bronze weapons. He's got the fire going to start to warm up. As the temperature rises, Neil prepares a mould made of stone so we can cast our own bronze sword. That's it. Oh, so exciting. Okay. Inside the fire is a crucible containing the two metals that together form bronze. 90% copper will make our sword flexible. 10% tin will make it hard with a cutting edge. Heated to 1,200 degrees oh. Celsius, we're ready to pour. That's good. Wow. Oh, look at that. Even that's a beautiful thing. Let's get the colour of it. My first sword. I'll just take that and it's off it now. We try to move it too quickly, it's a snap. And if we leave it too long in the malt, it gets stuck in the malt. And it won't come out. It's a bit like Excalibur, really. So what sure it is. I can feel it. So you should be able to draw it out very slowly, but don't. 
So that was a bit about um, history and, and metals and bronze. Uh, and then here we have another um, short video. Um, in the year 1625, an Italian... Oh, here I am at Vitalik tin mine. Precariously mounted on the cliffs, Vitalik is probably one of the most awesome tin mines in Cornwall. In its day, it was a very high producer. In 1846, the mine was even visited by Queen Victoria. The steel headgear here is Allen's shaft. Allen's shaft was built by Giva. It was planned to be Giva's next refuge. The load on 15 level at Hangwell Vane was yielding very high. Allen's shaft would be the ideal place to hoist the ore from Hangwell Vane. It was hoped that Allen's shaft would secure Giva's future. But due to the collapse of tin, it wasn't to be. If we look over to the cliff opposite, you'll see a hole with a boulder in it. This is the entrance to the old Boscowan diagonal shaft. In 1858, work began sinking this shaft. This was to provide access to the seaward extension of its loads, a third of a mile under the Atlantic. Many famous visitors came to Vitalik, among them Queen Victoria's 12-year-old son, Prince Arthur. Vitalik also had a disaster. In 1863, a wagon broke free of its chain, sending eight men and a boy hurtling down the decline to their death. Walking around Botalic is now a peaceful experience, especially in the spring where wildflowers adorn the cliffs. But at the peak of mining, the clifftop sort of reverberated with the noise of crushing machinery and the bustle of miners, bow maidens, and children all going about their daily tasks. Many fathoms under the ground, in the tunnels out under the sea, miners, often father and son, toil to break the ore. Hand drilling shot holes for blasting with gunpowder and working the narrow stokes with hammer and picker. The work was hard and dangerous, but mining was the lifeblood of the St. Just area and hundreds of families depended on this ancient industry. As the mining declined in the St. Just area, many of the miners and their families emigrated to countries like Mexico where they could continue to make a living. Well, that's the end of our Botalic trip. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to click the like button. All right, so this was about the uh, Botalic mine. And um, so you can, can see me as a German native. Um, there are other accents like Scottish or Welsh that are also hard to understand sometimes. Um, continue with minerals. Um, found this interesting here uh, was the uh, famous uh, tourmaline find um, in Cornwall, 1815 to 1820, on a on a farm called Woolley Farm. So there were exceptional um, British um, shawl crystals, up to four inches across, and they were found in a, a pegmatitic cavity a year or two before 1817. So that's not um, that's not, not clear when exactly it happened, but it, it does really matter. So specimens from this occurrence occasionally surface from old collections um, and maybe labeled um, Shuttley or, or Bowie Tracy, as well as a Woolly Farm, where they actually originated from. So the occurrence as a um, pegmatitic cavity in the Dartmoor granite uh, was uncovered by plowing um, at the time of the find. Um, size and perfection of the short crystals was outstanding uh, by world standards. Um, so um, some of the original, believe it or not, some of the original shawl bearing material was utilized by the farmer, Mr. Ellis, to build a wall. 
um, somebody disliked the the magpie appearance of the, the the color, and so eventually had the wall whitewashed. So and then later on, um, so the, um, the show was discovered um, in this in this wall. Um, you can imagine what happened to the wall then later on. So that um, people were making um, use and um, collecting just the material from that wall. Here we see um, um, some minerals. Um, so that's uh, one of the most famous from Cornwall, uh, the, the tin mineral, cassiterite. Um, see there's nice crystals here. Um, what you also can find, um, it's um, the, the cassiterite forming needles. Um, and the, the first finds of this um, needle tin um, were not in, in UK or England, but in Germany. So that's why they, we have a, a German word for that. It's called Nadelzin. So that's a literal translation, needle tin. Um, these, these are quite nice, um, hard to find. So you see, and they are, they are tiny. So you see the um, field of fury is nine millimeters. Um, other uh, tin cassiterite uh, formations, that's the uh, so-called uh, toadized tin. So the, you see this, this sphere here, these circles uh, that look like a, a toad's eye. Uh, that's uh, why they're called that way. Uh, and then it's also these formations, um, this uh, wood tin. So it looks like um, from, a, from a, um, a tree trunk. Uh, that has been cut, um, so the, the, the annual or the, the rings of, of, of the wood here, um, it's quite interesting. Um, so the, you can see it, so this um, can still be collected today. Um, the photo here is from uh, Peter uh, Trevelcock. Um, he also has a, has a website uh, with some interesting information. Uh, I contacted him last year and um, he's also selling uh, micro mounts. Uh, so we, Got quite some nice stuff there from uh, from Cornwall from him. Um, going back, to, uh, going further on to um, copper, um, as the um, after tin, um, the, the second um, largest um, volumes of metal to be mined there. Um, here we see a nice um, spinel twin uh, copper, in size of four centimeters. Uh, from the uh, Relistian mine. And um, here I've, I found this here uh, quite nice. That's uh, um, small crystals, uh, but copper cubes. And uh, it really looks three dimensional here, this, um, this view. Um, it's quite interesting, um, this, this type of formation. So continuing with copper away from the pure element um, to uh, sulfides. Here we have uh, calcosite uh, from the Giver mine, St. Just. Um, so uh, it's also a micro uh, mount size here with a field of few 2.2 millimeters. And here a nice um, calcopyrite, um, it's also so called blister copper. Here you see the, uh, the blister formation. Uh, it's also quite famous for that from uh, Karl Breer. Um, other copper minerals um, here, we have a, see a cuprite here from the South Carolina mine. Uh, this is a 10 millimeter crystal. And um, the type locality, you know, the, the bononite, uh, you see the uh, cockwheel formations here. Um, and this is so typically it has a metallic luster, but this one here is quite different. It's it's more reddish. Um, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, I haven't seen it um, this way from from other locations. But you see the cockwheels, but not the uh, this type of color. Um, then moving away from uh, from copper to lead. Um, here we have a. Uh, it's a so-called uh, Blaubly adz, and this is a, um, a pseudomorphosis um, of uh, Galena um, after pyromorphite. But what actually happens here is, and that, that's quite interesting, 
Uh, I think the world's most famous uh, blah blah ads, the pseudomorphs, are from uh, the Kaltenbach mine in Germany. It's in Western Germany on the Mosel River. And there's another location in Saxony and one more in um, in France, Western France, where you can find these blah blah ads. So what actually happens is you have Galena first, that then transitions to pyromorphite. And then you have another um, transition back from um, pyromorphite into Galena. Um, so these are um, pseudomorphs that are um, sought for, um, rare, rare to find. And um, there's uh, quite some interesting articles on uh, the, the um, geology and the, the building formations um, on, on how the, these mechanisms work. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting um, to read. Uh, another example here um, for um, lead-containing mineral, let's say Jamesonite from the Thierry mine. Then uh, some micromount size. Uh, we here see a nice uh, bismutinite from uh, 4A consoles. Um, so 15 millimeters filter few. And uh, you can also find in uh, Cornwall is a uh, nice millerite needles. So this one here is from the Greystone quarry. So these are then examples for minerals containing bismuth and nickel. So moving away from um, elements and sulfides uh, to secondary formations. Uh, here, uh, that's a quite uh, stunning picture. That's the parent St. George Sea Cave. Um, that's an Atacamite sinter. Um, so Sea Cave means this here is salt water. And then here you see the secondary formations in a, this gallery uh, of Atacamite. Uh, that's quite impressive. So you see here the, so this is actually then two, two people, uh, one sitting, one standing here, gives you an idea about the dimensions. Um, more mineral secondary formations, the uh, type locality and famous uh, botalakite. Um, this crystal's here, that's the botalakite, and then you have uh, conolite here to go with it. Uh, so you see field of few 2.2 millimeters. This is from the uh, Levant mine, Saint Just. <clears throat> and uh, here we have a nice um, tiny um, olivonite from the Ting Tang mine, which is a, a nice luster and it's uh, transparent. So let's spend a um, few minutes on the uh, the Wheel Garland mine, Sand Day, uh, which counts five type localities. It's the Chenevik site, uh, Clinoclass, Cornwallite. Kind of white and uh, lyrocanite. Um, here's an old um, picture um, of the uh, the mine when it was still in uh, in operation. So you see here the ore production uh, over the centuries. So late um, 18th century, uh, 2,500 tons of copper ore. That's an estimate. Um, the other numbers are from from um, book records. Uh, so then, uh, yet um, high activities here. First half of the uh, the 19th century, and then um, though the uh, mining operation was stopped and then and restarted in the early 1900s, uh, but just for smaller amounts of tungsten ore, uh, some tin and, and uh, arsenic. So minerals um, from this uh, mine here. See the uh, Chenevik site, uh, field of few eight millimeters. This is uh, copper, iron, arsenate, and uh, so th this mainly all here copper uh, arsenates uh, with other elements uh, being um, going with it. Here we have a, a cleaner class, um, two millimeter crystal. Then uh, cornolite. Um, this nice uh, greenish colors here, and the uh, the famous um, Lyrocconite. Uh, this is a micromount, so uh, there's uh, larger crystals, which are really rare 
Um, but uh, so you see this forming um, nice crystals here uh, on, on matrix. And so this arsenate copper uh, has some um, aluminum in it. Few more, got the uh, lutlamide. It's also a type locality, Cornwall, Hogil Jane, uh, Kia, uh, field of few eight millimeters. There's nice tiny crystals here. And again, uh, a clinoclast, class, uh, which in this appearance um, is called uh, black beetle ore. So you can see why it's named that way. It has uh, the crystals look like black, black beetles here, uh, that would crawl over the matrix or, or other um, minerals. And then uh, we have two more here, uh, some specialities. Um, so the uh, liraconite um, on uh, turquoise or azurite, uh, but uh, that was not clear from the information uh, where I had it from. Uh, this is the next Carabertson um, specimen. Uh, here you see the uh, liraconite here. Um, so field of view 3.2 centimeters. So uh, this uh, would be really highly priced um, if it could be um, acquired. So you see um, who sold it. I think it has been sold now. Um, and then here, the last one, let's say, uh, found this very interesting uh, uh, pseudomorphosis, uh, siderite after fluorite with quartz. So you here you see the, the siderite replacing the fluorite. And there's this is hollow um, in here inside this crystal, and then you have quartz crystals growing in there. So you see the size here, this ruler, um, that's one inch. Um, so that's in about, say, three to four inches, uh, this, this length here. Uh, so this is a specimen of the uh, British Museum National History. And uh, I think that's about it. So um, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for joining.